Okay, I think people are entering the web webinar and um, it's my chance to welcome all of you, students, colleagues, faculty, and community members to A Plus D Mondays, our weekly program um, every Monday evening where we celebrate the people and ideas, the movements and artistic practices that most compel the Berkeley faculty, our students, community, and staff. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design, and it is my privilege, as always, to welcome you tonight and to uh, invite you to join us every Monday night um, as the academic year proceeds. If you've been tuning in or if you've come to A plus D Mondays in years past, you know that this series is usually hosted in the beautiful theater of our BAM PFA Museum. You also know that it is co-curated by a range of campus organizations, including the African-American Student Development Office, the Department of Art Practice, Berkeley Center for New Media, BAM PFA itself, Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, the Arts Advocates of Berkeley Law, Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, and many other organizations. Tonight, we have the privilege of co-hosting with Cal Performances in online programming that is adjacent to their exciting online season this year. Uh, if you've been tuning in, or perhaps as a reminder, or I'll tell you also for the first time that this year, this series is uh, convened around a central title, Together reinventing politics, reimagining health, a title that we came up with collectively as a means to um, uh, uh, share our, our, basically to articulate our shared commitment to pursuing questions of togetherness, to actually think about what it means to be together online and offline when so many of us are subject to constant redefinition when it comes to our political lives right now, as well as our embodied lives as citizens on the planet. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the plan, uh, the plan for tonight, but before I do, I want to acknowledge the fact that even this theme of togetherness has a politics and a politics that becomes more urgent and poignant when we acknowledge the land uh, on which we gather. Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, is sited on the unceded and ancestral land of the Ohlone people, uh, even as we gather online or offline. Um, we recognize not only the deep and rich Ohlone history of this land, but also that the Ohlone tribe are flourishing members of the Berkeley community and of the Bay Area community more widely. Many of us who gather here tonight or as students in um, HUM 20 who gather every Monday night, all of us recognize Berkeley to be a special place, but we know we're not the first to recognize or to settle or to celebrate this exceptional place that we have the privilege of calling our campus. Tonight, we're going to get to hear from artists who have been thinking about the aesthetics and politics of gathering, of togetherness, for quite some, time, quite some time, indeed the politics you might say and the aesthetics of ensemble. I wanna introduce you um, without too much more um, to the artists who are behind Real Enemies, which appears in our Cal, Cal performances season. Darcy James Argue, uh, the Van uh, Vancouver born Brooklyn, Brooklyn based composer and band leader is one of the central forces behind Real Enemies, but also um, if you believe others and I do, a central force in the reinvention of the big band, acknowledging its past, um, in, uh, invigorating its present and reimagining its future. Um, he has done so um, through, as band leader, for instance, of his ensemble Secret Society, which has toured nationally and internationally to great acclaim. Uh, one critic, for instance, calls it maximalist music of impressive complexity and immense entertainment value in your face and then in your head, unquote. Argue made his mark with his critically acclaimed 2009 de debut, Infernal Machines. 2013 saw the release of Brooklyn Babylon, which like Infernal Machines before it earned the group nominations for both Grammy and Juno awards. His most recent recording, Real Enemies, released in the fall of 2016, also earned a third consecutive Emmy nomination and has been praised as, and I love this one, quote, wildly discursive, twitchily elusive, and a work of furious ambition, deeply in tune with our present moment. 
just the kind of mix that Berkeley audiences love. Working in coalition, we also have tonight the writer behind the show and director Isaac Butler, who is a writer and theater director uh, for a number of different venues and artists, most recently also um, of The Trump Card, a meditation on the peculiar rise of Donald Trump with the solo performer, Mike Daisy, who made his reappearance to the stage there. Also recently, and of course relevant for us tonight, Butler wrote and directed Real Enemies, which was commissioned originally by the Brooklyn Academy of Music and named one of the top 10 live events of 2015 by the New York Times. Butler holds an MFA in nonfiction writing from the University of Minnesota, and his writings appeared in a number of venues, including The Guardian, American Theater, Los Angeles Review of Books, and many others. He also lives in Brooklyn. Peter Negrini, designer behind the show, has designed on Broadway uh, and off Broadway for um, a, the, some of the most distinguished artists and venues um, uh, in the United States and abroad. For those of you who are theater people, you will recognize what it means to be the central designer behind pieces like The Best Man, Fella, Nine to Five, and Say Goodnight Gracie on Broadway, or other designs of the public theater, such as Here Lies Love, um, Fetch Clay and Make Man at the New York Theater Workshop, the elaborate entrance of Chad Deity at sec Second Stage, Notes from Underground at Yale Repertory Theater, Grace Jones Hurricane Tour, Rent New World Stages. He's worked with Bill T. Jones, um, Ar Arnie Zane Dance, uh, and numerous um, theaters around the country, as well as internationally, including experimental theaters like Nature Theater of Oklahoma, or uh, international theaters and festivals in Salzburg and Vienna. Moderating our di dialogue tonight um, is Berkeley's own Jeff K. Mackey Mason, our university librarian and our chief digital scholarship officer. Um, he is a professor at, school, at the School of Information at UC Berkeley and in the Department of Economics. At Michigan, he was also the Arthur W. Burks Professor of Information and Computer Science and a Professor of Economics and Public Policy. He was the founding director of STIET, STIET, a research program for socio-technical -techn infrastructure for electronic transactions. He is passionate about public universities where he has spent his entire career. And I'll also note here that Jeff is himself a distinguished musician. So we welcome here tonight artists and thinkers who embrace many movements and practices, forms, themes, and histories. Artists who couldn't be better positioned to help us think further about what it means to be together and about the aesthetics of togetherness. So even if you're muted, please do your best to send the warmest of welcomes to the team we have gathered here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, for the introduction to this evening and to our guests. I'm really delighted to be here with our guests and to be part of this, although uh, hopefully very much in the background. I just want to say a few words about the format for tonight's conversation before we get started. Uh, it, we do intend it to be a conversation um, between the three artist creators. Um, I'll be uh, guiding them with some questions, getting things going, but I encourage them to just take off and, and run with things and uh, share their thoughts and interact with each other. Um, but we also want the audience to participate. Now, there are too many people for uh, free for all, but we do have the Q&A uh, button below. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. And I'll be moderating that. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but actually it's best if we take questions throughout. So if you have questions of any sort uh, related to the piece or the conversations, please enter them in the Q&A window and I will do my best to work them into the conversation as we go along and then reserve some time at the end for some more open questioning uh, and, and discussion. But please do enter questions as we go along. It'll be a much more interesting evening for everybody, I think, if we do it that way. Um, to get us started, I'd like to ask each of our three artists and creators, um, they were just introduced with a bit of their uh, biographic information, but I'd like to ask them to say a few words themselves about their artistic journey um, before they commenced work on this piece. Uh, Darcy, Isaac, Peter, in any order, perhaps you could maybe share an anecdote that helps us understand what you brought with you as you came to the creation of Real Enemies or, or something else that you think would help the audience get a sense of who you are before we dive into the subject of tonight's talk. So um, 
Isaac and I had collaborated before on uh, a prior multimedia work, uh, also commissioned by BAM, uh, called Brooklyn Babylon, uh, which uh, Isaac also directed. And uh, we were casting around looking for what next to pitch to BAM uh, after the success of Brooklyn Babylon and thinking about um, what we might be able to do in a multimedia environment. I have this 18 piece big band, but uh, I've been fortunate enough that I've had the opportunity to work on an even bigger canvas uh, and do these, these epic multimedia collaborations. And I, I sort of had the instinct that I wanted to do something with nonfiction, um, that I wanted to do something with um, the world around us, whether it was the present or the past or, or something along those lines. And we um, were tossing around, um, Isaac and I were tossing around a few different ideas. And it was actually uh, my, my girlfriend, who's the journalist, Lindsay Beierstein, uh, who said, well, you know, if you're looking for ideas, you might want to read this book. And she passed me Kathy Olmsted's Real Enemies, uh, the book uh, whose title we have stolen with Kathy's permission for our show. And uh, I was reading through it and it was just a fascinating and very humane explanation of why people believe conspiracy theories and also how people in power take advantage of the belief in conspiracy theories and exploit paranoia, which is a very, very powerful force, as we have all seen, for their own ends. Um, and so uh, Isaac and I, uh, we got together with the producer of Brooklyn Babylon, uh, Beth Morrison Projects, and she put us in touch with Peter and we um, met for coffee and connected from there. Um, and uh, Isaac, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about how that process unfolded. Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm a nonfiction writer by trade, but also a theater director by background, um, which is a very weird combination of jobs to have. Um, and so we, you know, when I was very excited by the idea of trying to do something, you know, innovative with what nonfiction could be and what it could be on stage. But, you know, one of the challenges immediately is you, you just heard Darcy describe this amazing book, which I should say Kathy's book, they just went through a 10th anniversary new edition with a new epilogue about Donald Trump and is well worth your shekels. But, um, uh, uh, you know, we have this great idea for, for a thing, but like, is that a show? Is like probing conspiracy theories a show? And so we, we wanted to start thinking about how that could be a satisfying experience for an audience, even though it doesn't have the kind of traditional narrative that an audience uh, expects. And luckily, um, Peter was very into that idea very early on. And um, very quickly, you know, when you're starting a project from scratch, you have to figure out rules for yourself pretty fast or it gets, or, or it can be anything. And if it can be anything, it usually ends up kind of being nothing. And so one of the things we, um, you know, Peter very quickly had this idea of these 15 screens playing, um, you know, pieces of information on it. And we then very quickly had the idea that all of that information would be found, that all the text would be taken from primary sources, the images would be sort of found in our culture. And the idea was that we would just sort of be presenting I mean, it's shaped, but we're presenting a lot of stuff at you. And then the audience would have to kind of navigate their, their way through that. And now I will pass the baton on to Peter to talk a bit, a bit more about that. You know, it's funny because uh, probably Isaac and Darcy still think the reason there's 15 screens is, is some sort of numerological thing. But it was really, I was just trying to keep up with 18 band members and, you know, <laughs> just straight competition. Wow, but, I'm learning uh, the truth tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think the interesting thing and in, in what's compelling about um, about sort of what they brought to me when they were, you know, sort of asking me if I would join their merry band was was about the organization of information, right? That, that the, the primary problem, challenge and excitement in it was was the sort of gauntlet that, that the two of them threw down, which is like this very, you know, here's a, a you know, 300 page book and describing all these sort of this history and all this information, we want to put all that on stage and we want there to be no words. Like there will be no one who will speak to you or tell you any of this history. How do we 
uh, use both music and essentially image and a small degree of text, although not that much actually, but primarily image to take us through this history um, somewhat uh, elusively, but nonetheless take us through this history. And that to me was sort of this uh, fascinating challenge about how do you use image as a conveyance of information, which is so much the world we live in now. Uh, and it's sort of trying to figure out how to be in that moment. Thanks, that's a great start. Um, before we go into details about the piece, um, maybe if, if each of you could just take a moment to briefly describe your primary roles, composer, director, designer, uh, those may be obvious, but just to orient people a little bit to what uh, what positions you played in this. I, I hate to pigeonhole you. I realize you no. all interacted and did many things, but if you could give a sense of what those roles are, sure. That would be great. Sure. Although they they did not. I mean, they're semi permeable membranes. Yeah. I would say in many ways. <laughs> um, so uh, I am the writer and director of it, which in this case means we started with this document that I wrote. Um, with lots of input from Darcy Peter, to be very clear, called The Spine. And so what happened was we, we figured out what the structure of the show is going to be first um, and what each chapter of it would do roughly. And then I set about trying to figure out what is the actual journey of information in this piece? What images are we seeing? What text do we see uh, in what order? Right. So like what just sort of what is the journey of each of these chapters? Um, and sometimes that was like we see images of Reagan and sometimes that was we see this image of Reagan. But, you know, like so there was a lot of like and then um, and then as I would finish pieces of it, uh, I would send it to Darcy and Peter for feedback and we'd adjust and adjust and adjust. And I got through a certain chunk of it and then my daughter was born. And so I stopped working on it for two months. And, I, and at that point, Darcy started working on um, composing to it, uh, you know, adapting that into music and Peter into um, uh, uh, creating some ideas for the visuals. But I'll let them talk about, talk about that part. Well, I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about that spine, like it's it sort of, we, we had a lot of very abstract conversations about the shape of the piece structure, what, what, what is the overall shape of it? And then indeed, you know, Isaac wrote, wrote this sort of thing that, that in a way was sort of this challenge to me is like, how can I make all of the words on this page unnecessary? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you would read it and in some cases there were specific call outs of images but a lot of it actually was fascinating and interestingly more elusive than that where it was like you know just words like security you know or home or you know th these much more abstract concepts that the the goal was how do you render those ideas purely visually and some of it was and then here's a paragraph of history and we have to figure out how to <laughs> render that visually um so that beyond the like pure aesthetics of the evening also, my job was this strange job of, of erasing that original document, right? So then making it, uh, it sort of unnecessary, anything that was left was unnecessary. And literally I had a checklist where I would like, you know, have a big black marker and cross off each line of the spine making, yep, I've done that. Yes, I've done that all, all the way, all the way through it. And so that my first step to that was to try to turn it into a series of static images. It was just a, a long document full of static images that were trying to replace the text. Right, and so while Peter was uh, working with the spine and trying to source the, the images for that, um, I was working with the, the spine uh, and the structure um, that Isaac and I and, and Peter had determined, which was a circular structure, an Ouroboros of conspiracies, where we start with chapter zero uh, at the 12 o'clock position of the clock of you are here. And the whole show takes you on a complete circle right back to that opening chapter uh, in giving you sort of a glimpse of the paranoid moment. Uh, and when we did it in, at uh, BAM originally, when we premiered it in the fall of 2015, it was the paranoid moment of 2015. And now it is the paranoid moment of 2020. And um, it's interesting to me how those feel different and how those feel the same. But 
knowing that we had this uh, structure and knowing that it was a piece about paranoia and about conspiracy, um, I knew it had to be a 12-tone score. It had to use the language of high modernism for a huge variety of reasons. One is, the main reason is because like that is the sound of uh, of tension and conspiracy in cinematic language. The films of um, director Alan Pakulik and the, the scores that David Shire uh, and Michael Small composed for, for those paranoid films in the 1970s films like The Parallax View and All the President's Men, those soundtracks were huge, you know, like, you know, when we're starting to figure out like, what is the sound of paranoia? It's like, oh, okay, it's right there. That is the sound of paranoia. That's very clear. Um, and then you kind of expand outwards from there. But those film score composers were very extremely influenced by um, classical modernism, by mid-century modernism as embodied by 12-tone um, techniques. And so the challenge for myself was to use those techniques, um, both to structure the entire work uh, and to structure everything moment to moment, all of the melodies that you'll hear, all of the the chords or the the vertical simultaneities, and all of the 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 moment to moment things that you will hear in the piece are coming from the same twelve tone row. It's one twelve tone row that is used throughout the piece, and all of the various permutations of that. And I had to find a way to make that um, sound like my own language. And that is a challenge that various jazz composers have, have taken up at various points. And um, for, for me, it was, um, it was a little bit slow going at first. And then I, I found this really great book by Joseph N. Strauss called 12 Tone Music in America. And it really kind of opened it up of, oh, there's so many different ways this can go. This doesn't have to go in just one particular aesthetic bucket. Like it's just a set of tools and those tools can be used to build all kinds of different things. I can use those tools to build a cha-cha. I can use those tools to build church music. I can use those tools to build like electrofunk. Uh, and it all comes from the same place. And, you know, uh, Arnold Schoenberg uh, is dead, so he can't can't um, chide me for what I did with his system. One of the great things about this uh, is that, you know, Darcy had recommended lots of music. We watched a lot of movies together. Uh, you know, all three of us watched a bunch of the sort of same movies. And then Darcy was like, here is a playlist of 12 tone music for you to listen to. And these are the scores we're thinking about. And I would loop those while I wrote. And, you know, um, by the time I came back from my brief paternity leave, there was all this other activity going on because I'd only written about a third of the show at that point, I think, maybe the first four piece, four or five chapters. And so um, what was great was then this, there's a period where like all three of us are inspiring each other constantly. You know, Peter would send me some images. It's like, oh, that's what it's going to look like. Okay, well then I know that I need to write it like this. Or like Darcy would send music around and we would all kind of give each other notes. And, and that's when, for me anyway, the real um, fun started once, I mean, once I caught up on sleep, uh, but that was that was when the real real fun started in terms of the, the collaboration for developing the piece. Well, and, and specifically speaking about that permeability, it, 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 it was that sort of ideal collaboration. You sort of look at the way films are scored, right? And it's like, well, the edit's completely done. I mean, they know exactly what you're gonna see every moment. And then a composer comes in and writes something to that edit. Right, and you look at the way like conventional theater music is made, or something like that, and the music is completely done, and then I come in, and directors and people come in and build a visual life for it. And what was exciting here is it was actually those all those things were happening simultaneously. So, you know, a series of images would go up to Darcy, and he would write some new music, and it would come back, and sort of structural things would happen, and I could say, hey, I need like. I need more space in this moment. Like I need more time here to get through this blob of material that Isaac has written for us. And and you know, two weeks later, there'd be new batter music that <laughs> that did have that space, you know, or not always. But you know, like it was that that sort of had that uh, sort of genuine collaboration that that is so great and so hard to come up. Great. The, the, the excitement and, and fun you three had together uh, shines through very, very clearly here, uh, which is kind of interesting given how uh, unfun much of the content is, but apparently you had a good time working with it. Um, I want to mention that we already have a question coming in from the audience, which is great. I'm, I'm mentioning in part because I'm going to put off answer, uh, asking it just briefly. Um, I think at this point, 
before we dig in further to the piece, um, I suspect not everyone with us has had the opportunity yet to see it. Um, and I think one of you have a, has a clip, uh, an excerpt from it to share with the audience so that everybody can get a sense of it. Darcy, you'll do that. So we'll, we'll watch the video excerpt now, and then I uh, will get going on discussing in more detail the piece, and I will answer the question that's come in. And the rest of you, please feed other questions to us. Thanks. Go ahead, Darcy. Mm-hmm. 
Wow, thanks. Uh, damn, that Rob Wilkerson solo gets me every time. <laughs> damn. Ah, oh, he's so good. I, uh, I remember when I first saw this, that chapter well, in part because I will confess my son recently got a job working for Lockheed Martin, so that... <laughs> I see. So you're going to try to silence the truth? Is what you're <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I, I've made my confession. The fix okay. is in. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, let's, uh, let me go to the question from Annabelle. Um, it was related to some of the things that you uh, three were talking about before. Uh, she asks what the greatest challenge was in translating words into visuals and music. I'm not sure who wants to start with that. Well, that, Peter, you know, I think that's for you, yeah. buddy. You know, I, where did I screw you the most? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a long list. Uh, uh, you know, I think that you know, part, there there was a pair of challenges in that. One one is is purely about information, like the the challenge for us to some degree, it existed on sort of two levels. The first was there's basic information that we want to communicate, like intelligibility and to some degree, ensuring that we uh, intelligible to us is not necessarily intelligible to an audience, right? So, so constantly uh, working to to keep an eye on intelligibility, but the additional challenge was about the degree of intelligibility because the, there is sort of a, a a a sort of larger goal of the piece that wasn't about being unintelligible but was about sort of walking a very fine line that was about placing an audience in an experiential place that is a, is a simulacrum for the sort of the, the society's experience of information and information density and those processes by which you start constructing theories of conspiracy. So, so, you know, there was a lot of that. Um, uh, and also not as true in the version that we've built for Cal Performances, but in the original version, there are still humans on stage that we do occasionally want to pay attention to. Um, and music that we don't want to sort of overwhelm visually. The, uh, the problem of overwhelming it auditorily isn't actually that large. Uh, but the problem of ensuring that we the, the 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 human actors and in this case the soloists are not um, completely lost and that 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 experience of a live event was also a big component of the challenge. Uh, following up on this, Peter, or uh, probably primarily for you. Um, Except for the music, most and uh, most of the content in the production is found. It's not original to you. It's found text and images. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious why you took this approach. And in, in particular, something you just said uh, about wanting to make things intelligible. Uh, to what extent was were you looking for things that people might recognize so that they felt like they it, it was it was somewhat familiar to them and it, it brought back or it provided greater context to what you were presenting. Um, I mean, that that familiarity is key. You know, uh, an image of Nixon with his finger out speaks volume. The amount of words it would take us to communicate all of the sort of information in that one image um, is endless. And, and so that one of the values of those known images is about information density, right? That they can contain so much information you see Ollie North and you recognize that that's that photograph of Oliver North testifying for Iran-Contra. And what we can do is recall so much memory that would be much more difficult and slow to do with text. So that there's, a, there's an innate value um, that a found image as that a created one would, would never give us. Um, and also the, the bigger point about the, the sort of the whole undertaking is to try to simulate or mirror the way that uh, we are all consuming information, right? You know, that, you know, 15 screens blaring at you is not such a bad analogy for modern life, right? Like how, how it is that we are picking up all these visual scraps and connecting them together and building from them a narrative, a narrative that unfortunately might be our own narrative and not one that is shared with a community at large or a society at large. Yeah, um, you, oh, sorry. 
No, please go. Um, you know, one thing that I thought a lot about when we were creating this show is, um, and I know is a is a book that that Darcy's a fan of as well, is um, Scott McCloud's uh, uh, Making Comics. Making Comics? That's the first Understanding one, right? Comics. Understanding Comics, right. It's Understanding Making and then Remaking. Understanding Comics. And, you know, we talked about that book a lot because he, McCloud has this great idea, this great concept that he calls closure which is when you're looking at multiple panels of a comic, you know, the Hulk's fist is like this in one panel. And in the next picture, it's like this. And, you know, someone is flying, the red skull is flying backwards or whatever. And your mind has made the connection between those two panels and animated it. The artist didn't do that. He, it's a still image and another still image. And your mind has created this kind of animation. And, and we wanted to play around with closure, with that idea as a lot in terms of um, how much work you needed to do to connect the dots that we were laying out, um, which changes moment to moment in the show. There's sometimes where it's very clear in, in uh, there's a chapter called the dark Alliance where we lay out a conspiracy <laughs> theory, like very step-by-step -step with a whole diagram and everything, you know, but that, um, that conspiracy, which is about the CIA allowing the Contras to traffic cocaine into the United States starts with images of cocaine and the load screen of the Nintendo game Contra, right? So like, we're always playing around with those associations and how you do it. And also throwing information that you might wanna follow in some different way to different conclusions, which is again, part of the experience of living in our information overload society. And, you know, we're excited by that. Yeah, the, the piece, um, both the live version and the film, I think it was, important to us that there uh, there's no right and one singular audience experience to go through it and someone who like there there probably isn't anyone alive other than Isaac or Peter who recognizes every single reference that we make in the piece and even if you do they some of them go by so quickly that you're you're not going to be able to if you just pause a second to recognize, you know, one panel, uh, something's going to be happening in another panel that you just miss. And that's by design. Uh, and the idea is that different audiences will uh, sculpt their own narrative through it and sculpt their own way of experiencing the work. So in the live performance, uh, in the live environment, when we have 18 musicians on stage and uh, this massive clock face that uh, is our soloist playing surface, um, people have to like consciously redirect their attention away from the live musicians and up to the screens to, to absorb the content that's up there. And they can look up and down um, at, throughout the course of the show. They kind of curate their own experience through the show. And, and some people who are more interested in the music might not look at the screen so much. And other people who are sort of like really obsessively trying to follow the, the stories, follow the narrative, uh, may find themselves uh, overwhelmed and distracted at times by the sheer amount of, of music and number of people on the stage and all those kinds of things. But the idea is that the each audience member needs to uh, connect their own dots and to construct their own meaning from the show up to and including what are what it what it means and particularly what the end of the show means where there is a there is a moment uh, spoiler alert where uh, the show kind of collapses under its own weight and then starts again from nothing and how each audience member reads that moment is uh, going to be very dependent on how successfully we've activated their paranoid impulses throughout the course <laughs> of the show and how successfully we've been boiling the frog uh, throughout the course of the piece. Thanks. We've, we've got a follow-up uh, question that I want to uh, read right. to you, um, but it also reminds me I meant to say something after the clip showed for our audience. Um, if the uh, students in the audience haven't seen this yet, um, it's available uh, for streaming for the next couple of months, I think, until, until the about, end of the year, basically. Until the end of the calendar year. Uh, until so later. In, until the day before Inauguration Day. It oh, is there you go. Until <laughs> January 19th. Okay, great. It's on the calperformances.org site, and uh, students can uh, obtain a pass to stream all of the performances from this fall, 
th this plus 14 other uh, performances for $15. So it's an incredible bargain. I urge you all to uh, do that and get a chance to see this amazing production. Uh, the question that's come in is from Peru. Um, there's this trend of how the next generation is consuming news via social, me social media. As these news posts are primarily images, I was curious if you found some limitations on translating all the information perspectives in text into images and how different people have different interpretations maybe. So, you know, in part, I, I hear this question in part is, what did you lose when you had to move to primarily images? Uh, did you feel frustrated and what did you have to give up? There's, there's a couple moments when we're trying to actually like tell a clear, where there's like clear narrative beats where, um, you know, I, I, you always regret the choices you made that, that lock you into anything, right? Where sometimes it's just be like, God damn it, why did we say we were gonna do this with images? Um, but it always worked out, do you know what I mean? I mean, like there's some moments where we, I think we struggled with that. Um, it, uh, um, but, but to me, I always found it exciting, the, the challenge of, of, of trying to do this purely imagistically or as purely imagistically, there is some text in the show. All the text is found too, um, except, we, except for maybe this one, but I, I can talk about that in a second. Um, uh, um, but, the, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I found that challenge very, very exciting. It is true, like I teach, all three of us teach undergraduates, right? And um, they are, one thing that was exciting about doing this is how image literate they are. They are really used to seeing an image and being like, I get that meaning immediately. You know, like I teach, I've taught Shakespeare in the past, right? And it's very hard to be like, let's talk about the challenges of interpreting text. But if you show them a clip from a film of Hamlet, they'll be able to be like, oh yes, here are all the interpretational choices the director made and what they meant. Because they're just much more visually literate than I was when I was their age, even though I was pursuing being a stage director. Yeah, I, I think also the other thing that's true about all those challenges and frustrations in clearly trying to make a story beat are, are at a higher level actually the point of the yeah. show. Like, <laughs> the point is, this is not the way to, to, to create a societal understanding of truth. Like, this is not the way. <laughs> and so, the, it, again, you know, the medium is the message and, and, and the all the ambiguities that come from the form that we've chosen, in fact, are the greater point. Yeah. We've talked about a number of the elements, uh, of the creative elements that you pulled together. It's a very complex piece. It's got text, still images, uh, video images, original music, uh, borrowed music, multimedia presentation styles. Um, one of the things that, that is striking about it is you, you have an organizing structure, which is a clock. You've mentioned that, and we saw five o'clock was the excerpt you showed us. And you mentioned that in the stage production, the clock was the platform for the soloist. Can you say something about why the clock? Where did that idea come from? And, and what does it mean to you? So, uh, I mean, the, the clock is such a great organizing structure for music because there are 12 chromatic pitches. So that lines up very nicely. Uh, if we have a 12 part structure, in our case, a, a 13 part structure that comes back to the beginning, then that gives me sort of 12 different forms of the 12 tone row that I can then kind of make the, the, the primary row form the prime form for each chapter um there's also you know like really fundamentally as i am a jazz musician and you know um I, I i want this this music to connect to what i actually do and not just classical 12 tone music um the 12 bar blues is actually a really important part of real enemies and uh it's maybe not uh incredibly audible at first um but many of the solo forms are are based on um, some variation of the 12 bar blues few of them are actually 12 bars most of them are something weird like seven bars or 36 bars or something you know something asymmetric uh, asymmetrical or, or changed or um, uh, modified or, or filtered in some way just the way you know uh, Duke Ellington filtered uh, blues in diminuendo and crescendo in, in blue which is one of my favorite Ellington pieces but it the the that structure just uh, is 
so uh, musically potent, but also visually potent and thematically potent. One of the, the quotes from uh, the paranoid style in American politics that we hear at the end of the show is, uh, you know, time is forever running out for the conspiracists. For the conspiracists, the time is forever just running out. And that, uh, that idea, that sort of franticness is uh, incredibly um, uh, rich to, to work with. Also the idea of the doomsday clock and us being, you know, one minute to, to nuclear annihilation and all of those things. There's so many uh, ways that, that clocks can be used uh, visually and thematically. At one point there's a stopwatch swinging back and forth across the screen and we all know what that means, right? <laughs> so the, the idea of, of, of the, the clocks and the clock face and uh, as an organizing principle and as a sort of a visual motif throughout the piece uh, was something that was really powerful for us. Thanks. You, um, you've talked a bit about the fact that this was originally a stage production at, at Brooklyn Academy Music BAM. And uh, Isaac, of course, has a, his background is uh, from that production. But I think, Darcy, you also had a still you wanted to share to give people a sense of what that production looked like as opposed to the single screen production that we're watching now. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, a visual here. This is uh, a shot by uh, Noah Stern Weber of uh, Beth Morrison Projects. Uh, so here you can kind of see the the array. Uh, you can see the uh, the clock face where I'm standing uh, at the middle of it, where the hands would be. Uh, there currently aren't any soloists on top of that platform, uh, but that's where they would get up and stand and step up to one of those microphones. And then we've got um, the rhythm section kind of arrayed behind the seated uh, musicians. So uh, guitar, bass, piano, and drums on these elevated platforms behind the band. Uh, and then we have uh, this wonderful perimeter of lights from our lighting designer, Maruti Evans, and then the, the array of, of screens. Um, and those 15 screens, uh, Peter, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about uh, how those worked in the original production and how they were arrayed and how we projected on them. Yeah, I mean, I think that the primary thing is that they weren't a flat plane, and that was one of the big challenges we faced. And, and uh, concerns we faced about turning it from, we had, we had actually years ago, shortly after the band premiere, had sort of had a whole series of conversations about could we make this a film? And uh, they never went anywhere. <laughs> but, um, you know, in the necessity as the mother of invention, <laughs> um, you know, column, uh, you know, this has sort of forced us to tackle that, but they were actually not in a single plane. They were sort of arrayed in a sort of sh uh, shell shape over the band. Um, and, you know, one of the big challenges in translating it to, to film is about um, some accommodations we made for the scale of a, a, a visual field. You know, when you're looking at something of that scale in a theater, um, you're physically adjusting your focus, right? You're, you're literally moving the muscles in your eyes to look at one of those screens or another one of those screens, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, the film we've made anywhere, but perhaps in an IMAX theater where you're able to take in the full field at the same time. And, and that, uh, that transformation was one of the challenges we faced uh, bringing it to Cal performances and our virtual uh, version. So I would like to ask you a bit to talk a bit about the production process uh, because this is a very unusual uh, situation where you've done two different uh, versions of this production. You talked a bit about how you came together uh, and started the, did the original production and the, the process that you went through to from the spine through the composition and the visual presentation. Um, when the call came uh, this summer, I believe, asking you to recreate the piece for online presentation, First, what was your reaction? Well, that came at the end of a whole, that was a, getting there was a whole process. Cause originally, you know, the show happened in 2015. And then if I could just rewind a bit, the show sure. premiered in 2015. And then we actually um, toured it to Europe uh, a few months later. And we were actually in Amsterdam the night of the Brexit vote. 
that's when we were doing it was when Brexit happened. And, you know, we all got a little drunker than normal because we just sort of were faced with the abyss that all the things that our show had talked about were sort of, it was sort of sprouting up in the culture in a way that was very scary to us. And so it became a running joke between us for many years, whenever some particularly paranoid, you know, when our president would say something particularly crazy we would say we would text each other and be like gosh if only someone had a show they could do about what's thematically going on in our culture and so we were very excited when cal performances was so uh into the idea of bringing this show we just it was like so perfect we would get to do it in berkeley i love berkeley and we get to do it right before the election and then of course the pandemic happened and so we started going through a bunch of different ideas of how to make it work one of which was if you want to know a little deleted scenes on the blu-ray was that we would do a pop-up drive-in movie theater and then live stream the band soloing over the 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 studio album you know like like replacing their solos live so that you would still feel like oh i'm seeing something live then that couldn't happen because things got worse and worse and worse um and so then it became okay if we're gonna do this we gotta like really just finally decide to make a movie out of it and 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 try to within that preserve the energy and soul of a live performance so that it didn't just feel like oh we dumped the video from the show <laughs> you know onto a screen for you to look at um and then also within that we wanted to make some light revisions to the material in light of the politics over the last five years but uh how we solved those problems i will leave to my esteemed I think, you know, the one thing I'd say that was critical about the whole undertaking and one of the early things we said to Cal Performances is we do not want to make a record of a live performance. Yeah. Like we want to make, a hope, and you know, everyone who's listening can be the judge if you've seen it or will see it, that, that it, it needed to be something that was of the medium, right? That it's not, okay, we got the band together and put them on a stage and then we had some cameras come in and film the band playing the music like that that wasn't our interest it wasn't a, a document of live performance it was making something that was uh within our own aesthetic universe um and and that was complete in and of itself a film as opposed to a document of live performance so a couple of uh, oh sorry go ahead uh, so i just wanted to to also explain how we um actually did record uh the music um because i think it's it's interesting to me at least which was that uh, in august we booked uh, a recording studio uh, out in long island uh, city uh, in queens uh, spin studios and uh, we brought the band in there um, either individually or in pairs to uh, create new improvised solos for um, over top of the existing studio recording from the pre-plague times so we'd already recorded the music, but uh, we wanted there to be um, visually, we wanted to show the soloist and we wanted the musical experience to have something new in it, to have the, um, the reflection of everyone in the band um, who have been um, you know, locking down and dealing with the, the collapse of any opportunity for live performance and dealing with this current paranoid moment we're in and, and, and allowing them the opportunity to express through improvisation what was happening. And so for a lot of the, the people in the band, a lot of my co-conspirators in Secret Society, this was their, their first time performing um, music uh, with other people since the pandemic struck. And um, it just so happened that with Real Enemies, I wrote a lot of duets into it. Um, so it opens with a duet between um, Ingrid Jensen on trumpet and Sam Sedigursky on clarinet. And there are multiple duets throughout. And uh, the musicians, uh, all of them, were very excited to be part of the performance, but particularly the ones who got to like interact live with another player and feed off each other and trade ideas and have that uh, live energy. And it was 
really exciting for, for me to be back um, in the control room. It's exciting for me um, to not have to conduct. This is the first sort of performance of Real Enemies where I have not been out front uh, with, you know, my metronome and my foot pedals and like my score all marked up and really sweating, having to be very clear with my cues. And uh, for this, I could just sit back in the recording studio with the score in front of me and my mask on and um, really just enjoy the 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 energy that came from these musicians being able to make music again um, after a very long uh, interregnum. We have a couple of questions that have come in that are relevant to the both of these productions and in particular the difference between the productions and and uh, what you were trying to accomplish and what you experienced. Let me let me feed you those. Um, first from Shannon, our host this evening, uh, she wonders how the translation changed for the COVID moment, uh, that is the screen and Zoom display that was necessary for it. And in particular, do you think of yourselves as creating a different experience uh, doing it on the screen? Is it, do you, uh, inter did you see something different for the audience from this than when they saw a live production on stage? I mean, by its nature, it's different, right? I mean, because they're not seeing it with other, with a, a couple hundred of their closest strangers, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a live experience and we don't have, you know, there are things we don't have. We don't have Maruti's brilliant light and set design, for example, you know, um, but just because we don't have the same, you know, like that doesn't mean that it's less than the idea was let's try to make a, at some point it was just, let's try to make a really great experimental documentary. You know, and once like we sort of all agreed that this was a new form that we were going to take, um, then it became about sort of embracing those those aspects of it, which is great because we also watched a lot of documentaries while researching uh, creating real enemies in the first place. And Peter, I know, was a huge fan, is a huge fan of Adam Curtis. And so we, you know, he on his recommendation, we watched a bunch of his stuff. We're all big Errol Morris fans, of course, you know, um, and in fact, the excerpt of the show you saw is very much in dialogue with Errol Morris's films. Um, and so, uh, but one of the things I, at least I discovered, I don't know about you guys, maybe let me know what you think, is that when we had the music synced up and the 15 images on there and it was going, I was shocked by how well it worked. Like at first I was like, we're gonna have to change a lot of shit about this show. We're gonna have to adapt stuff. We're gonna, sometimes we're gonna lose the grid because the grid's artificial, it's just an effect, right? Sometimes we'll lose the grid or we'll blow images up or we'll, you know, we'll do all this crazy stuff. And then I watched, it, I was like, no, actually what we built has a lot of integrity as is. And that was actually one of the big surprises of, of, of making it was that it worked so well, um, so quickly in this new form. And I think the other, the, you know, the interesting thing though, we did spend a lot of time looking for those specific events or moments that relied on, on our absent friends, right? That relied on lighting, that relied on the physical experience in the room. And what I think, you know, the, some of the su hopeful success in it is that we're sort of adamant that while we need to replace those things sort of dramaturgical or experiential function, what you don't want to do is try to reproduce them, right? Because you, you're not in a theater and we're not- Like the together. flashes. So like, yeah. So there's like these sort of like blinders. It's like, okay, we're not going to reproduce that because, because it will be just us trying to simulate something as opposed to saying, how do we achieve that same thing using the tools that are, that are germane to our new medium? And I think, you know, that's, every time I see an undertaking like this trip is where I feel like people have missed that. Um, you know, and it's hard to do, do right? Because you're sort of like, I, we all know what it was before. So we're kind of filling in the blanks. And the, the risk is that we have allowed our memories to fill in the blanks and left all of you, the audience out in the cold. You know? <laughs> and, you know, that's the puzzle is how to, how to look at it with fresh eyes and look at it as a new undertaking. You know, when we um, first got together to discuss the film, I think Isaac and I, the, the first thing that Isaac showed me is Orson Welles' F for Fake, uh, which is a, a documentary film that completely blows up 
any concept of what a documentary film is or can be or the visual language of documentary. I mean, it is an extraordinary film. If people have not seen it, you should see. Please F see, for see fake. it. See, for the love of God, watch F for Fake. If you take nothing um, else away from this talk. But it, it was uh, it was shocking to me to see just in the opening sequence all of these things that I've I've seen like secondhand and referenced by other filmmakers and all of these things and they're just seeing that as as an ur text of like oh wow like a this is where it all started and uh, you know how is it that more people don't know about this Orson Welles gem but also just the incredible vision of what a documentary film could be and what it could involve and the kind of storytelling that you could you could engage in with a, a documentary and 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 really like the kind of games that you can play with the audience if you are Orson Welles and I think that spirit of it was uh, animating us now as we looked to well now we're, we're really we're making a movie we're making Real Enemies the movie and what what is that and what can we do with that and I think you know um what Peter has has managed to do, uh, if if nothing else, it looks different from any other documentary that you have seen out there. <laughs> there is a, a, a totally unique visual aesthetic that is, you know, like there's there's nothing else that subdivides the screen into fifteen for the entire show. If nothing else, there is there is that. We also got a <clears throat> question from Griffin, a, a bit more abstract, to, to see if you uh, can dig in on this. Does the process of audience curation lead to conversation and debate by design? Uh, you had two different types of audience in, uh, for these two different productions. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, we certainly hope it does, you know? I mean, I think one of the things, I'm interested to hear you guys, what, what, what you felt about this. You know, it, it is a little unnerving to just be poker faced and just be like the audience is going to have whatever description it has, you know, or whatever experience it has, and that's okay. And I have to let go of interpreting things it can be a little nerve wracking. Um, but, you know, that was sort of the brief, you know, that was the, the show wouldn't work if we weren't doing that. Um, and so you have to be cool with people coming away with it with ideas that are not yours or not what you wanted them to come away with it um and i and i uh, away you know taking from it as they go away from it and and that to me was was at least on a you know that to me was part of the psychological work of doing the piece i guess on some level as an individual um so i certainly, remember yes, um Isaac, I just wanted to yeah uh, no no prompt interrupt you. please take over. <laughs> I, I wanted to prompt you to tell the story because I didn't see it because my back was to the audience. But when we previewed this show at Virginia Tech, there was a very dramatic walkout at a particular moment of the show. Oh my God, I don't remember this. I can't believe I don't. You don't remember, remember this? this? Well, when was so, it? Was it? There's it this was act. Like, it was Virginia all Tech, right? Was it? No, 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 no. It was. It was later. It was an elderly couple. And I didn't get to see this, but you described it to me at the time, and, and I, I will never forget this. So uh, they sat through 70 minutes. That's right. That's right. They sat of an 80 years, minute right? show. <laughs> and then their breaking point was when we returned all the way to chapter zero uh, and returned to the You Are Here reprise. And we played uh, a video clip of Sheriff Joe Arpaio talking about the results of his investigation into then President Obama's birth certificate. And uh, this man uh, and his wife harumphed audibly and got up and right. walked they, out. They, they were upset that we five used minutes that, left in the show. They were upset that we used that as an example of American paranoia. The birtherism was an example of American conspiracy theories they were upset by. Um, <laughs> I had totally After sitting through that. 70 minutes of uh, aliens <laughs> and death cults and everything yeah, else. That's the breaking point. That's that's the one yeah. that you, uh, um, you know, it's interesting because I was recently, when I was recently rewatching it, we have a early piece called The Enemy Within that's about COINTELPRO. And there's a part where um, this is a, I will break the poker face to explain one moment of the show. There's a part where we show the images and names of uh, artists who were persecuted for being suspected communists. 
right? And it's a it's a it's a big list of them. And I realized that it's like you could look at that and think we were just accusing them of being suspected communists. And <laughs> that had never occurred to me until about two weeks ago, where I was like, it sort of could look like we're on Hoover's side in this moment, which is like a really <laughs> weird thing to experience. But if people coming away with it being like, yes, Edward G. Robinson definitely a communist. He got what was coming or whatever. Yeah. That's 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 on them. That's on them. Which is an argument that people have made in the year yes. of our Lord 2020. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I also think that there's a sort of an illusion, to this idea that we can actually control the audience's experience. Like, you know, we just embraced, I think, reality, which is like, we're going to make something and everyone's going to be busy interpreting it anyways. And <laughs> so that the fact that they're curating their way through it, we just said, well, yes, that's what's happening, as opposed to deluding ourselves into thinking that no, no, no. We can we can make something that's one hundred percent clear, and and they can only be read in a single way, and that, that's an impossibility. In the end. Yeah. Well, you started to move into the next area that I wanted to launch into, so that's that's a great transition, and that's I want to talk a bit about the intellectual content. We've talked a lot about the production and the creative process, but uh, you know, great artistic creations almost always have a powerful emotional impact on the audience if they're if they're successful and good. And this certainly had that impact on me, but it's also powerfully intellectual and political, or at least I took it that way as, as an audience member. Um, you're not merely illustrating historically curious conspiracies. You, you've selected uh, particular ones to present. Um, I know you don't want to tell people, and Isaac, you just you know alluded to this, you don't want to tell people what they should think, but. But what does it mean to you? Are you are were you making a political argument? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so pull out the I, poker I, faces, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Jeff. Uh, no, I um uh, I make we're making a bunch of political arguments, some of which we agree with and some of which we don't, I would say, in that we all read a lot of different texts about conspiracy theories, not just Kathy's wonderful book. Um, we read primary sources, you know, I read primary sources by conspiracy theorists, I read sociological studies of them, I read interviews with them, essays about them reportage watch documentaries you know so um and because it's uh, it's found a lot of those arguments wind their way through that said um yes there's there are there there are, you know there all three of us are kind of eggheads you know all three of us are intellectuals i think and, and we definitely approached this and all three of us have you know, pretty similar lefty politics. And so, you know, we, we definitely approach those through those lenses because how could we not? I actually think a lot of the, the kind of thing that you're asking about is embedded in the structure of the piece and its journey and, and how it builds and actually wraps around in a circle. Um, it, it, a lot of our ideas about what conspiracy theories are and how they work are actually in that which i mean i'm comfortable talking about it with you if you guys are yeah. darcy do you have any objection well i mean I, I have no objection but I, I do have maybe an interjection which is yeah, sure. that um i think one thing that has become abundantly clear it's something that we all believed at the beginning of the show but if there is if there is one takeaway between 2015 and 2020 it's that conspiracism is its own political orientation yeah, absolutely right conspiracism is not uh it's not like the left is more prone to it or the right is more prone to it we all know like very very many examples that we have seen on our social media feeds and in the news and from everybody around us of uh, people who agree with us on our politics but their orientation on this con this conspiracist axis is through the roof. And I think like that idea of, well, maybe left and right isn't the best frame to analyze someone who has whose mind has been captured by conspiracism. I think that is much more evident now than mm -hmm. it was in in 2015 or much more widely apparent to the people who are watching this show because they have so many more examples of it from their daily life of people that they know who've just fallen down a, a, a rabbit hole. They're like, what what has happened to this person? You know, we used to agree on everything. 
Yeah. And, you know, another thing that we were very interested in, this comes directly from Kathy's book, I mean, is the interplay between conspiracism and government power and wrongdoing. So um, that, you know, our government does keep secrets from us and our government does conspire against us. Those are, those are very real things that happen. And there's an interplay between that and the conspiracism and paranoia that the everyday civilian might engage in. And it is hot, and, and both of those dynamics, or rather that dynamic between those two things is highly corrosive to our polity. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that was one thing that we really wanted to uh, uh, explore experientially. You know, it's not a paper, it's not a, tre a treatise, right? We wanted to give the experience of, of, of that um, uh, very much. And then we were also interested in kind of structuring the show the way we felt that conspiracy theories worked, which was to say that um, to start, <laughs> Darcy drew this thing on a piece of paper that I had lying around these concentric circles that we start, you know, that you start with the known knowns, right? Um, we start with like, the government can read your email, and you'll never know. That's something we all know, right? And so how do you get from there to QAnon, which is there's um, a child trafficking, sex cannibalism, Satan cult run out of a pizzeria in Washington, DC. By the way, great pizza at that pizzeria but the the, the uh <laughs> i've been there but the uh but the uh you know and cheese pizza is code for child pornography and all this other stuff how do you get from reading emails to that and we wanted to structure the show as a journey between those two points um and then you know uh uh and then that way be able to analyze kind of the dynamics of the conspiracies as they work but they also work visually you know which i think peter can speak to that, that there's a there is a visual component to that, you know? Well, and, and I think, you know, it's interesting to hear that, that we us all try to talk about what the intellectual sort of thrust is, because I think th they all sort of are a cluster of ideas that are, that we each come at from a different, slightly different angle, which is, I think, what makes it exciting is, you know, for me, a lot, the, the other question is about, it's about um, the transformation of information from text to, to visual form, right? What has that done? What, you know, people used to read the newspaper and now they look at images, right? And the, that is the mode of communication. What has that changed about the way we, the, the way we communicate and the way we decide as a society what truth is, right? Uh, either how do we decide what truth is, you know, or how do we communicate with each other? And, and how is that uh, related to a sort of decentering of knowledge and authority? And you know, how do all those things intersect? And what we're trying to kind of do is create a microcosm of that in the piece. Isaac, when we talked earlier, you told me that there was a structure in the presentation of stories. And one thing that watching Real Enemies uh, reminds all of us, I think, is that not all conspiracy theories are false. I mean, there's sort of a, an assumption that, or this association with conspiracy theories being wacko things like QAnon. Uh, in, in fact, I read a book that argued that the pejorative connotation that has attached to conspiracy theories is itself a CIA conspiracy. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, so so you, you included a mix of theories that for the most part, I think most people agree are true uh, now. And you included some that for the most part, most people agree are false. And then you also had some that I think are probably still quite hotly debated uh, in there. But you also said there was a structure to it. And you mentioned this a moment ago about the presentation of true and false stories. What, what changes about the type of stories you present as the show progresses? Um, it, I mean, I would say the show gets, um, what the show is presenting to you is less and less confirmable as the show goes along is the easiest way to put it. But I would also say there's actually like another category that I think we were especially attracted to, which is the story, the thing that is true, that is not that widely known. And that is um, uh, true, meaning like absolutely confirmed and, you know, are, are not that widely known. And you would at first be like, what the what the heck are you talking 
about. Um, and one of them that pops up in the show is this one called Operation Northwoods, which is a real thing where in the 60s, the joint in the early 60s, the Joint Chiefs proposed to JFK, like, why don't we do a bunch of false flag operations to come up with a Casas belly so that we can invade Cuba, right? And the list of things they came up with included like acts of terrorism by people disguised as Cuban nationals. Or there was one where they wanted to shoot down a passenger plane, but they couldn't figure out what they were gonna do with the passengers so they didn't die, right? And stuff like that. Um, and Kennedy didn't go for it clearly, but you know, that was, and, and the reason why we know about it is that in 2004, the US government declassified it and it became a key source text for 9-11 truthers, right? So stuff like that, we found really great. The stuff that like the audience might not have heard of, but it's actually just wild and, and, and real and in there and then used as a springboard for things that are not true or fanciful or, you know, whatever. Okay, I want to give the rest of you a chance if anyone to jump in. Um, the we're all hyper aware of conspiracy theories in the present day uh, for uh, various reasons. Um, you've done a deep dive into conspiracy theories as you've been talking about. You've you've done a lot of reading, a lot of thinking about this uh, more than most, uh, probably all of us uh, in this audience. Um, what thoughts, if any, do you have about why? conspiracy theories seem uh, so ripe for attention in the present day. Is there something going on in our current day that, that is, seems like it makes conspiracy theories more salient and more prevalent than normal? Or maybe that's not true. Maybe that's just a, uh, a, a incorrect characterization of the present. I don't, I mean, I, I think it is true that they're more salient now. I used to really bring up all the time this study I read that showed that actually levels of conspiracism remain mostly flat. And then every five years they're like, this is the, and it's never been this conspiracist, but it actually has remained flat the whole time. Um, but I, I, my, my feeling about that has really changed over the past couple of years. That's something that has changed since we made this show actually for the first time in 2015. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Peter. I'm sorry. I'm talking too much here, but, no, but no. I, I, I was just um, that, that, has changed and i think it's a common personally i would say it's a combination of two things one that same study shows that in moments of relative powerless the if you are someone who is ideologically prone to conspiracism if you are experiencing powerlessness it is more likely that you will that that will be kind of act that part of your psyche will be activated um and the other is the complete um leeching out of all authority in the institutions that used to tell us what was true and what was not um, and I, I think those two things have created a lot of a lot of problems. And now I'll now I'll be quiet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the interesting, you know, one can say the leeching out of authority. You know, one could say exactly the same thing, except describe it as the democratization of media, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> which you know has all these good feelings associated with it, but but it is actually a problem. Like, you know. 40 years ago, there was probably like a dozen white men in New York City who decided what the truth was for America, right? And that's what went on the evening news. And the fact that that that, that um, cabal has lost control over the narrative and over the definition of truth, there's loads of ways we can think of that as a good thing. Unfortunately, totally. there's a lot of bad things that come along with it. And that's the, the trouble, you know, the, I think the interesting question is, you know, are we in just a transitional moment where, where society is going to learn, people are going to learn, the populace is going to learn how to function without, you know, the, the, the sort of news departments of the three networks telling us what the truth is and, and, and figure out how to survive. I don't know or we're not going to figure out how to survive. <laughs> I mean, one of the one of the realities of the present moment that we had to address in the revisions to chapter 0 to chapter uh, to, you know, to the chapter called you are here is the the present media moment and the ability for 
social media. You know, social media is the greatest vector for propaganda that the world has ever invented. And it has become incredibly, incredibly lucrative for the founders of Facebook, for instance. And their entire business model is based on the fact that um, engagement with paranoid material is extremely, extremely high. And I, I think um, there, there is certainly a tendency for uh, uh, leftists of a, a certain generation to believe that you know the cure for for bad speech is more speech right and we are i think grappling now with the the limitations of that theory as it pertains to uh these networks these sort of hyper aware algorithmic optimized networks for the spread of whatever is most engaging and it turns out like that that allows for propaganda and for malicious actors and for you know for uh honestly for hate and white supremacy and all kinds of things to spread in in a way like that is absolutely uncontrolled through the mainstream like to get access to a mainstream audience that that the people propagating those ideas have never had before um and that's that's one of the the realities that we're we're grappling with in in so many ways and the ability of you know, uh, everyone being siloed and kind of creating their own um, ecosystem for information uh, has created uh, a, a, a public that across the political spectrum is incre incredibly skeptical of, uh, of authority generally. And whether that authority is coming from the government or the president or the Center for Disease Control or the World Health Organization or any source of authority, there like that erosion of the of, of the automatic authority of those entities. And you know, as Peter says, there there's a way in which oh well that's democratizing, and then also a way in which well there are bad actors who have been waiting for years to exploit this moment and have found their lane. And, you know, I think it's incredibly, uh, there was a thing in the, uh, in the news uh, late last week, I guess, about how uh, Facebook had, quote unquote, introduced additional friction into their algorithm. Not exactly clear that what that means, but, but what, what you're great discovering phrase, is though. that, I know, right? <laughs> Like, um, and you know, that what it boils down to is they've just slowed down the shit funnel, you know, like they've just slowed down the speed at which uh, this sort of conspiratorial thinking can take place and can spread. And it was sort of telling to discover that, oh, you have a, you have a button for that. You like, you have a knob, <laughs> you can like right. dial up and dial down the degree to which you are destroying society. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and the only consequence is that you're going to make less money if you dial down the destruction of society. Um, and I guess they've decided that it's, you know, in their interest to briefly forego the, the additional compensation, uh, in the, in the short term. Yeah, I mean, it's wild. You know, when Darcy and I first met and became friends, which was before we started working together, we both had blogs, you know, that was, that was when we were commenting on politics. And the moment in which we were doing that, which I think was sort of the ultimate catastrophe for authority in many ways, was of course the Iraq war and then the occupation. So you had a war that was like complete bullshit. Right. You know, where where there, there there's a conspiracy for you. Right. The lead up to the Iraq war. And then you have the war and then you have the occupation and then you have the people in charge constantly telling you things night after night that everyone knows are not true about how it was going. You know, everyone knew it was not true and they would still say it. And then everyone in the media had to kind of pretend that it was true. And and and, you know, in that moment, if you were to be like 
well, clearly the media has failed us. These institutions have failed us. These organizations have failed us. We need to, you know, pull the power out to this online world that we are currently pioneers in and it's all gonna work out great, right? But then, you know, actually the way that happened is, <laughs> you know, has, has fed what, what, what um, we've ended up with, which is a very scary moment. We have one pending question from the audience I want to get to. And I also want to remind the audience we're, we're very near the end of our time. So if you have, uh, this is last call on questions. If you have any, please put them up right now. Um, the question that's been pending is from Catherine, uh, who says she's struck by how the images and texts in the piece are largely Western or US, US and European based images, languages and concepts. Did you consider how these multimedia, multi-narratives might translate or not to audiences from other cultures and times and spaces? Hmm. Well, I, I would say that, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, on the, uh, how I would put it is this, you know, we really made the original show for BAM and for the audience that was going to come see it at BAM. It is designed to fit into the BAM Harvey, which is a very weird performance space. We actually had many design conversations about, um, well, do we make it so that it will look, you know, pretty good at, at BAM and then maybe maybe good on tour? Do we just make it for BAM? You know, we really made it for that context and as the three of us. And so, no, we did not spend a lot of time thinking about um, how the show might play in um, other cultures. To be com to to be completely frank, we made it for a very we're, we made it for the audience in the borough that all three of us live, um, uh, uh, in the hopes that other audiences would then find things that were of of interest in it. You know, um, and and we wanted to make something that was really specific to our experience of this of this present moment. And that is yes, that is absolutely a Western. A, an American, a well, two Canadians and one American <laughs> experience um, uh, uh, of the moment in, in which we currently live. Um, that said, there are references to things that are not purely American all throughout the show in both the images and, and the music, but that's the lens, that's our lens. That's, that's, that's where we're coming from. I mean, well, our, and our I think source document is a piece of, uh, you know, it's a book about American history. And that's, yeah. that was ground zero for us. Yeah, and I think it also relied greatly on our personal experience. Like, I think if it has value, if it has value beyond an American audience, I think the value in it is perhaps a, a sort of an explainer, right? You're like a window right. into, you know, the uh, the the horror show that that the rest of the world has been watching for the last week. And actually, um, certainly when we took it to Amsterdam, that's what they thought of it. They were like, oh, this is a window into these peculiar, deranged <laughs> animal people on the other side of the Atlantic that have all the money. You know, it was certainly, you know, it was anthropological in some ways, I think. Well, as we're wrapping up, I can't resist asking the question that's been on my mind since I first heard about this piece and before I saw it and then when I saw it and I would really love to hear from you. Who are the real enemies? Uh, hmm. We all are. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, the real enemies are the heat death of the universe. No, um, uh, <laughs> budget limitations. And um, no, I mean, we, we took that title because we loved Kathy's book. And of course that title comes from the, um, the quote, even paranoids have real enemies, right? Which I think is the fundamental dialectic on some level of both that book and our show is that, you know, um, there are, you know, not everyone has our best interests at heart and that's real. Uh, uh, and, you know, um, at the same time, there is also such a thing as paranoia. And of course, there's the, uh, from uh, Infinite Jest, uh, Pimulus's poster of the Mad King going like, yes, I'm paranoid, but am I paranoid enough? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is uh, sort of the, the mantra of our show, as, as Isaac uh, likes to say, everyone thinks they are exactly paranoid enough. That, 
Anyone who is less paranoid than them is just a sheeple. And anyone who is more paranoid than them is some crazy tinfoil hat wacko. <laughs> we all think we're exactly the right amount of paranoid. Well, Peter, Darcy, Isaac, thank you so much. This has really been a lot of fun and uh, really enlightening. And it is a terrific show. Again, I urge anybody who hasn't seen it yet to go see it at least once, multiple times. You're, you'll find that you need to watch it multiple times to uh, grasp a lot of what's going on. This has been a, a terrific conversation. I'm so glad you were able to do this. We all appreciate it so much that you created this show for Cal Performances despite the pandemic uh, and allowed us to uh, share in the experience. Can I just Kennedy. say how grateful we are to Cal Performances for giving us the space and the resources and the support to do this show. We were so excited to do the show and bring it out to California, and uh, but they were so enthusiastic about helping us adapt it, and we couldn't be more grateful to them. Uh, and we are, of course, grateful to you, Jeff, for leading such a great conversation. Yeah, th thank you. Just it was so, and and, and the leap of us saying we're going to make something different. <laughs> we'll deliver it to you about. Right three or four days before the premiere. How about that? And it was, we really appreciate it. But it's going to go great. It's going to go absolutely great. Trust it's fine. us. It's fine. Trust <laughs> us. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank Shannon, you. do you have great. anything you want to close with? Unmute enough to say, hey, uh -huh. really, as I said um, earlier, and I can also undo my video to say thank you everyone for being so uh, engaged on different time zones you know about this hybrid form which was already hybrid when you began and became differently hybrid now on zoom now on the screen and it really has contributed to an ongoing conversation about as i said earlier what it means to be together so thank you everyone thank you thank you jeff thank you, thank you all right thank you jeff it's good night all thank you so much all right Okay, to be continued, I hope. Yes. Bye.